welcome everybody. Uh, this is our, sometimes we do stand up meetings and the format for that is uh, to talk about what we've done over the past week, what we have planned to do over the next week. Uh, if they have any roadblocks in particular uh, that we need help with, or if we have any any resources that we need. Um, but today is is just a, a, a little less formal of a meetup. And, and um, I was looking forward to uh, maybe if, if you all wanted to to present or walk through the the highlights of the uh, of the new revision of the specification um, that that might be might be something to talk about um, yeah so Andreas are you can you go over the changes now or uh, uh, I mean yes I certainly can go over yes I can okay Perfect. I mean if you want me to share, Yes, you, please go ahead and share share your screen. I mean, if you have it, you can share it. But I mean, I'll, I'll share it though if you want me to. Go ahead and share it. Okay. Um, let me let me bring that up here real quick. Uh, let's see here. How do I share here? Oh, share screen. Um, and let's see here. I'm gonna just share the one. Surprise that. application for some reason this is not my application is not showing up one second um so it's not let me share uh, so when i go into oh here it is okay it does uh, so it, the it doesn't share anything that's in the tray that's not open oh okay <laughs> Okay. Good. Good. Um, so um, here's a spec. Uh, Andreas uh, sent it to me uh, last night, and um, and then uh, so where do you want to start? Uh, I mean, it depends on whether you guys want to go over the spec in general, or you just want to uh, see the new things that are in the spec. Well, I was I was mainly thinking about just going over the the changes, mainly the changes. So um, yeah, I think that would be totally okay because we have your overview uh, from a couple of weeks ago that uh, mm -hmm. where you where you walked through the, the the specification and introduced it. So if you just want to talk about the the main highlights, the things that you would like to draw people's attention to, then that would be fine. Okay, so why why don't we uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. So this right here, the package construction stuff that we, we did see that before. Um, why don't you go ahead and go down to the preamble and just uh, go down a little bit right there, yeah. So keep going, keep going. So here, okay, there, there, there is a change here. So this is the control information that we can see in the first real OFDM symbol that uh, belongs to, that has to be mapped, that is not part of the um, of the preamble. The, the, the last, the last uh, Zadov true sequence uh, preamble B is, is really an OFDM symbol as well, uh, and it can be generated as such, but uh, I don't consider that the first thing that's, that's in the resource grid. The first thing is really this, uh, this first reference symbols and the control information is in there. And I changed, what did I change here? I changed, um, hold on, where is it? The signal field format. So the signal field, you know, is going to tell us a other types of control information. It's really a bit of a progression, you know, you have control information that gets decoded first that uh, allows the receiver to understand how certain things are set up. And then the signal field tells you yet more configuration information. And we have, Leonard and I agreed that we will use different formats of the signal field. Uh, you know, the signal field will tell you uh, the, the kind of error encoding that we'll be using, things like that. And in order to accommodate um, not just what the flavor that we want to do, you know, which may be polar code, coding or low density pair check coding or who knows what, that there could be other formats as well that we haven't defined yet. That could be for other customers or for other people who want to use the technology. 
but the only right now only format one is defined and format two and uh, we can defined in the specification. So we can uh, look at those next if you guys want to. So for that, let's let's go further down. And to to get an idea of where that is, let's say in the the packet construction, um, the control information occurs right here, basically. Yeah, it's at that black guy right there that where it says the first reference symbol. And then the signal field is where, right? The, sig the, the first symbol of the signal field is where, uh, yeah, there we are. That, that's where the, the, the first reference symbol is. And I, in, uh, in reality, I should make this black line thicker because it's, it's kind of thin compared to the first, you know, the signal field symbol one. Right, the signal field symbol looks a whole lot thicker than, than the first reference. But in reality, they're both just OFGM symbols. Right, so that's right. something I should correct. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, it, I, just for the recording, though, I just wanted to make it clear. First, we get our AGC burst, we get preamble A, preamble B. The control information occurs right here where this red thing is. It is an OFDM symbol. So, uh, you know, uh, in time, and then starts the symbol reference fields. Okay. Um, exactly. Let's see here. Mapping. Uh, we we'll go to the signal field. I think. Um, yes. So, it, in essence, the the um, signal field gives us kind of gives a receiver instructions on what to do with the payloads. So it's focused on on, hey, uh, we've got payloads, there may be two of them, you know, uh, payload A and payload B. And um, this one here only has... Um, it is, I, I, made, I made that change as well. This, the, yeah. the signal field tells you how, how to read payload A. It doesn't tell you how to, what's in payload B anymore. It's... Um, there's a reason for that, uh, and I, I'll show that to you guys further down. Okay. The, the way that, you know, the way that payload, the way that payload B can be organized, the information in there can be organized is, uh, it's not really, it requires a little bit more flexibility than what I'm doing here. Here, it's just like, hey, everything is, you know, this coding and this strength of coding and it's it's kind of very static and you know you need to go ahead and read what what's in preamble a at the beginning like in some of the mac information will tell you where things are in preamble b and this is they do this nowadays they do this in ylan and certainly lte does that where they realize certain sections of the of the bandwidth of your signal bandwidth have excellent uh, sinar and some of them have kind of poor sinar so they can they can locate information you know with with uh, very high qualm uh, in in certain in certain areas of the band you know of, of the signal bandwidth and optimize you know the throughput very significantly in this way so that's why that was done and Technically, you know, so there are things in the spec that the drone application doesn't necessarily need, but they are. So there are additional things that 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 are interesting for potentially other applications as well. You know, not just purposely drones. So not everything that uh, I do in the spec always makes sense for the drone or is necessary for the drone. I just wanted you to keep that in mind as we're reading through the spec. But uh, oh, there's a typo there, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I think uh, yesterday we talked about having the upper end of this maybe be forty ninety six. Um, yeah, we can we can it, change that. You know, once we figure out, we can always go back and change those numbers anytime we want. And when yeah, that's we have uh, comfort that, with that. So would that be for the forty megahertz? version the 2048 to uh no that's that is the, the 
IFFT size. The IFFT size will change if, you know, in, in the in the OFDM modulator, we can use a different IFFT size and then it'll pop out at 40 mega, megasamples per second immediately. If we use the 1024, then it pops out as 20 mega, megasamples per second and we would have to up, up sample it. Um, yeah, so, so the, the bit rate and the uh, encoding blocks are independent from each other, Michelle. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just curious if the 2048 to, to 4096 was for, that was for the 40 megahertz version. No, no, no. Um, so we got to remember that. So the reason why I was thinking about 4096, it, um, two reasons. One is, uh, we're going to be streaming large amounts of data. And in general, these packets are going to be larger anyways. And, yeah, I think it's a good change. It's And um, the, the 4096 is a little bit lower overhead from, a, from let's say, a bandwidth usage because of there's going to be a, a, a CRC tacked on to the, to the end of the um, block, encoded block, or, you know, um, Unencoded, so there's going to be a CRC that's in, encoded as part of the block. Let's put it that way. And then, um, and the other thing is, is when you really think about it, I think 4096 is only like 128 bytes, you know. So, um, which in the big scheme of things, that's a small amount of of, of data, anyways, that goes across. So. The downside of using 4096 is if you do have, let's say, data that goes across that's less than that and it happens to fit into that block or whatever, you, you'll have to zero stuff it, which from my perspective is not a big deal. Um, yeah, I agree. I think anyways. that's that's a, that's cool. Um, okay, uh, Andreas, mm -hmm. uh, go, go ahead. Okay. so. So that is the format one, and we can we can look. There's something else that's kind of interesting. I don't know how many people will understand what this means, but um, there's this reference count, clock count, which you see, which is the third from the bottom, right? And this is like this is really kind of interesting. What that is is, it's basically. You know, at the transmitter, there's a, a clock. There's a TCXO, right? There's a or some kind of reference oscillator that runs at 20 megahertz, and when and that at the receiver, of course, there's another one. There's another one of these uh, reference clock, which is also running at 20 megahertz, but they're not really, of course, running at 20 megahertz. They're running at some slight offset, depending on how that crystal was manufactured, what the temperature is, and all right there in the drone or you know at the bottom so there's differences and so th these differences they affect uh the frequency that we're transmitting at and they affect something called timing drift so so when the DACs are spitting out stuff you know they're not spitting it out at 20 megahertz exactly they're spitting out a little bit slower and maybe a little bit faster at the receiver and the idea here is that as soon as we start transmitting the, the preamble. I you know, we will look at what that count is. You know, we have a counter that will count these 20 megahertz clocks in the transmitter. And we'll write that into the signal field. And then the receiver, the receiver can see it, it says, hey, I know when I got I know when I got the packet in, and this is what the clock count was at the transmitter. And then he can look at a later packet and say, oh. You know, th th this is when the transmitter thought that this is going out, and this is when I saw it. And this is a way for the receiver to understand what the differences are between its own reference clock and the reference clock at the transmitter, and that that can that helps us that helps the receiver significantly to maintain synchronization. You know, uh, frequency synchronization, timing synchronization. I, I, I've never seen anybody do this, uh, but it's a, it's a it's a good scheme. It's a pretty good scheme. And it, what it allows also, it allows you not to send this very large preamble A. I don't know if you guys remember, there's this preamble A is meant to to figure out the frequency offset is between between the receiver and the transmitter. 
and it's pretty long. It's like, the, you know, there's, a, there's two lengths, there's 50 milliseconds and there's 250 milliseconds. And, you know, as temperature changes on, 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 these, on the different terminals, these, these uh, frequency offset seconds are drifting. And so I need to keep transmitting this 250 millisecond thing here and then in order to reacquire and, and, and make sure everything is synchronized. And if I send this, then I don't need to do this anymore. I don't need to waste my time sending, you know, a 200 millisecond chunk that I could avoid. So that's why that's in there. Um, and that's what, that's one of the new things I added as well. We currently don't have a 20 megahertz reference oscillator in the hardware. Okay, what's in there? We have the transmit uh, frequency for the 1106 uh, transmit symbols. It's supposed to drive down from a from a much faster clock. So the, the clocks on our, our particular hardware run much more fast than than 20 oh, megahertz. Yeah. So oh, this, would, this would need to be generated. And it, it sounds like a serial ID. Um, I, I think that the synchronization, like traditional synchronization methods are, are, are gonna work better than this, um, but I'll I'll sit and think about it and uh, see what we what can do. What do you mean by do. traditional synchronization methods? All of the digital synchronization methods that we traditionally use. To, to to generate these reference clocks? Uh, no, they they in order to synchronize between disparate clocks between the, you, you have no idea what the phase of the clock is or or the drift that you're talking about. So there's a whole series of methods used for digital synchronization, and I I have a feeling that those will be those will be more reliable than than a, a reference clock count for for a clock we don't have. That we, would have to, the, that we would have to make. We could also just count up the, the I mean, we already know in advance what the AGC burst looks like, um, already relying on that with the, you know, with the high correlation at uh, zero lag uh, aspects of it. Um, so those are already really good techniques. Um, so I'll look at this a little bit more, but this is uh, unfamiliar methodology for, for synchronization, so. Um, well, this is this is not meant to really I mean, this is the, the, the clocks that you have, you know, that, let's say you're, you're at one terminal and you've got your board, you know, on the, on the transmitter. Of course, you can synchronize different clocks any way you want, and you've got digital hardware that does everything very, very nicely. But this is not the synchronization I'm, that I'm talking about. The synchronization I'm talking about is that you have a board which is sitting at the receiver on the drone and another board which sits at the, at the transmitter, right? And the, whatever source clock you have, and it doesn't matter where it's 20 or how the 20 was generated, it doesn't matter. Somewhere on the system, there has to be some kind of reference clock, right? That, that, that tells the FPGA what to do and, and it clocks it, right? Something has to be somewhere. Yes, and there are several. Okay, but there's some main, there's some main reference clock that's gonna go uh, to the FPGA board that will that will make the FFT do stuff. Yes, right? there there right? are de there is a device clock like on the hardware mm -hmm. that we currently have. It's at um, 122 megahertz. Okay. I don't think you want to clock it that fast for something like this. And so I'll I'll keep looking at this and make sure I understand it. Uh, you know, but yeah. So it's we, it's we, really we, meant. We may not have see. a 20 megahertz oscillator at all. Uh, mm -hmm. We we may we may not need that. So it. It, I guess it looks like an implementation detail with with a 20 megahertz reference oscillator. It it and that sort of thing. I think we should be a little bit cautious about putting in the spec. Describing the, the desired outcome in the specification would be, uh, I think, would be what probably what you're after. It sounds like you're after a particular function and describing that function rather than saying talking about counters and reference oscillators. Those are implementation details. You probably want to allow for people to be innovative in their implementation and, and come up with different ways. And also the the number of clocks roaming around, there it may be very inconvenient and, and cost power to generate a, a 20 megahertz reference oscillator just for this one function. Well, I mean, the, the, we're not generating the 20 megahertz oscillator for this one function. It, I mean, I, I at, at the end of the day, I have to, def, I had to define uh, what the bandwidth of our signal is, right? I have to define what the bandwidth of the signal is and what the FFT size should be to go ahead and generate the signal within this bandwidth. So 
I yeah. have to define I have to define this 20 megahertz. I have to define a reference clock because the FFT is going to run at this reference clock and then you get a bandwidth out. So I can't really I can't really sit back and say, hey, you guys go figure it out because otherwise the bandwidth of this of our signal is who knows what it is. Okay, so the, if somebody... the, I, I agree and I'll 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 just let you know that the FFT is running slightly faster to get to eleven oh six rather than ten twenty four. And then the gap is filled with the cyclic prefix. So the clock rate of the IFFT and FFT are actually higher. They're around 22 megahertz. No, so I understand that. We don't have to have a 20 megahertz reference oscillator in order to, I mean, because this is, that's true. If you look at it from a, like a, if you abstract it out and say, what yes. is the math really doing? So I would just say, mm -hmm. if you could please just describe the functionality that you want and then you know, because you've already described it as a 20 megahertz bandwidth. We have that in the spec. So talking about a reference oscillator may not need that. That I would be cautious in this part. Describe what you want to have happen, the the requirement well, that you are okay. after. If, if, if I don't have this 20 megahertz, if I don't ha have this thing, then... Then tell us what the... Help, you just tell me what the... See? You tell me what the value that you want, that you define the, the value. What are you counting? You're counting from the moment, let's say, the remainder of the energy division of of the number of samples in in the AGC burst, perhaps. Like you're, or you want to know a difference between this and some other number, and then, like we should we should like say, okay, what is this really telling us? What information do you want the us to have? What is what is this requirement about? Like what is it attached to? And that would that would make it really super clear. Rather than because a counter and a twenty megahertz refer, I would just be cautious about putting implementation details like that in there because you may be able to get it without using those things. And if you put it in the requirement, then everybody has to build that in. Yeah, no, I understand. I guess I mean, for people, it's going to be very difficult to understand what it is that I'm trying to achieve here because I'm trying to achieve frequency synchronization between the transmitter and the receiver. I'm not trying to achieve synchronization within one of the terminals. Okay. That's not what it's about. It's between, it's like, because the, the transmitter is gonna transmit at, at let's say 800 megahertz and the receiver is listening at 800 and, you know, 800 megahertz plus 299 megahertz. Right, That's where right. he's listening because, he, because he, the clocks are not, the right. same. Yeah, this, so is this, a, is... this is a very common problem in digital communications. Yeah, right. we, I so... think it's it's definitely right to attack it in the requirements and to say, you know, or, or to have a requirement. And and that I think that's uh, good, uh, very positive, uh, you know, putting it in the specification, describe what you're after and connect it to a requirement. If you have a requirement for a particular type of a quality of a frequency synchronization, then state it as a as a requirement, you have to have the frequency synchronization at this particular level has to be maintained. Um, you know, well, so then, I, then I would then I would have to tell people, okay, you have to put a zero point one ppm uh, clock on both the uh, on both the transmit side and the receive side, and people that, can say, wait a second, that's very expensive. You know, well, that's so. a that that would be a choice. That's one of the ways to kind of make it easier to synchronize, but that's not not necessary. There's there's ways to synchronize between really pretty poor clocks. So I all, all I'm all I'm suggesting is that to be cautious about putting in actual hardware you know into a, into the spec that's all. And and we do have good methods of synchronization. We we can explore this and and do some trade-offs and and uh and be really fun to kind of show here's this counter exactly how much frequency improvement do we get with this counter you know in either compared to or with uh, the other methods. And you never know. I mean, you you may be talking about something that is uh, of great value uh, in concert with other other techniques, uh, essentially sensor fusion type of uh, type of effect. Okay, let's um let's keep going then. Absolutely. Yeah. This is great. I mean, I, I, I think um, certainly we can provide a count. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be generated off a 20 megahertz clock. It could be, you know, a count that's that's being enabled, you know, with a pulse at, at a rate of 20 megahertz. And so you can derive that, that K 
count from one of the local, any of the local onboard oscillators at the transmitter. And then uh, what this is kind of allowing us to do, and I think this is uh, what Andreas is doing is, is essentially what it ends up being is like a distributed PLL where you're, um, you, you have uh, like some kind of integer divide by n thing and uh, your, your, your reference is coming in as, as a, as a, you know, quantized count value. Um, I, I think that um, essentially, yeah, there's, um, there's other classic ways that we synchronize, you know, to the to receive incoming clock signal that that's kind of like what Michelle's talking about and in the digital domain you can also you know rotate the constellation a certain way to get it into the local clock domain so I I think that once we we get it into the local clock domain we essentially can um, you know do all our the DSP associated with it you know the FFTs and IFFTs um, yeah, so I, so long and short of it, is it, do we need the reference count? I, I don't know. And, but I, I think um, at the transmit side, we could generate a, a, a clock count that's incrementing at the rate of 20 megahertz with a local transmit clock. Um, <coughs> if it's, not divisible by 20 or something like that, then there's some jitter associated with it. So there's that aspect of it as well. Um, anyways, okay. Um, so <coughs> let's go ahead and continue. My, um, Andreas, uh, where, where do you want me to go next? Next page. So this is the, the format two. And the format two differs, it's almost identical to the format one, except that the number of bits that you have for each uh, symbol is, sorry, the number of bits for each QAM symbol, you can, you can vary it, meaning you can, you can say, hey, if, you know, across my signal bandwidth, I have really good sinar and really bad sinar in certain areas, uh, then you can, you can basically transmit with higher quantum constellation in certain areas and with lower quantum constellation in, in other areas in order to kind of adapt to the signal conditions across the across our bandwidth. And this is the this BPSA that you see like in the one, two, three, four, five, the sixth row, uh, where there's 76 times three equals 280, 228 bits. There are really these things called resource blocks, which exist in LT as well. They just kind of subdivide this 20 megahertz bandwidth into 76 little smaller blocks. And then in each one of these smaller blocks, you can say, hey, I want you to use BPSK. I want you to use QPSK. I want you to use 16 QAM here. I can use, want you to use 64 QAM, whatever. And um, that is the only difference really. Yeah, I just put more bits there. Don't worry about that. Uh, those are bits per symbol, even the zero bits per symbol, meaning we can decide not to transmit anything on certain subcarriers. Right. Uh, just because it's just devastatingly bad. Just why, yeah. why waste our time here? Yeah, this and is what you were talking about with the adaptive modulation. Is this? Is this, this is, yes, this is part of it. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, this is right. great. So um, there's, a, there's a couple of ways to. to, to, to there's a couple of ways to do this adaptive version. This is one of them, you know, but what this, of course, now what this doesn't let you do, it does not let you change the, the error encoding uh, for each one of the regional part because that's just not possible. It's, it's, not, it's not realistic. And that's why um, in the payload B, I do want to make that possible, that you can use both different QAM constellation and different, um, uh, coding strengths. Um, and that's why I sort of took out, you know, information for, for the payload B out of this, 
out of this uh, signal field because it just takes it it has a different format of how how I, how I will specify that. Uh, but the, so this is one of the ways to do adaptive modulation. I think it's a very cool way. Um, the only problem with it is that the drone can't be moving too fast when we do this uh, because if the drone is moving very fast then the channel changes so, so quickly that the receiver cannot get back to the transmitter and say, hey, this is how I saw the signal that you just sent me. You know, Because there has to be some feedback here. The receiver sees the transmitted signal. It can look at the signal noise ratio across, across the bandwidth of what it just saw. And it goes back to the transmitter and says, hey, this is what I saw. Go ahead and modify, modify your stuff according to what I saw to optimize the link. If the drone is moving super fast, then the channel is moving so quickly that we can't uh, we can't update it fast enough. Right now. So that's the only downside to this. But the drone often is not moving all that fast. Sometimes it's hovering and it's it's filming something, and then boom, you can you can get much much faster bandwidth, uh, much faster throughput suddenly uh, because you have this option available. Right. Yeah. This sort of this sort of makes me think of when you have a telescope and you are slewing to, you know, moving very quickly, you're moving the scope very quickly, you're not looking mm -hmm. through it and, and your camera may be off and then you start tracking and or you're stationary moving at the sidereal rate. And then you use all of your your magnification, you, you turn the thing back on and, and the sensors are back on. It's sort of, it sort of sounds like that's kind of what you're anticipating is that when you're hovering, you are using all your tricks in the in the communications link. And then when you're mm -hmm. moving, then you drop back to something that to ensure reliability more more than optimization. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. Let's see here. If, can I um, look at both of these at the same? All right, hold on for a second. So if we, um, can you see both of these things? I see one thing. Yeah, hold on. Um, you see the two tables next to each other? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like you can all, you, um, huh. Uh, the new share. Let me just do a screen and then share that. Okay. Now, can you see the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, that worked. All right. So hold up one second. So, um, And uh, zoom, uh, shoot, seriously, come on. All right, so here's format two and here's format one. They're right next to each other. Um, so I was trying to figure out, okay, so we have, um, so the fields themselves look the same, right? Except for BPSA. Uh, yes. Okay, so here, um, BPSA is here, and then um, number of bits per QAM. So how many bits is in here? 228? Uh-huh. Okay, I see. So then this value here is not correct. That's all the bits. That's the total number of bits. So it's 228 plus 1 plus 2 plus 12 plus 3 plus 3 plus 14 plus 14 plus 1 plus 10. It's all the, it's, it's, no, it's how many bits is in this field right here? Say again. It should be a lot less, right? So, in, in, so you got 1, 2, 12, 3, 3. This one here is what? 228. And then, but the total is 228 here. That's a two, that's an eight in the middle. That's a two eight eight. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, this is a two. This is an eight. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little bit confused because we have eight items. The number of bits per quam symbol for each resource block is. You can choose from from eight things. I'm not clear why we have two hundred and twenty eight bits set aside for choosing from eight things. Well, well sh shouldn't that be three bits, or is it? Am I missing something? Is it because we have seventy six different choices? No, we have 76 different regions inside inside okay. the and, total bandwidth. Okay, and, and you need you need three bits for each of the Region. 76. 
Okay. Yep. So that you want the flexibility. Yeah, I wonder if there's a better way to encode that, but let's keep it that way for now. We might be able to this we might be able to reduce a, the number of bits required for that. Yeah, well, this is these are kind of depicting the regions down here, right? Oh wow. That's so you see, pretty. See see the resource blocks on the left, resource block zero, resource block one, and then it all all the way at the top, it says resource block 75. Yeah. So the so this thing, it sort of shows you the shows you the band the band of the signal if you if you look at the vertical the vertical axis is frequency so at the very top you have the highest frequency which could be plus 8.5 megahertz at the very bottom uh, you would have the the most negative frequency which would be minus 8.5 megahertz in that case um, once of course that is up converted to 800 megahertz and yeah. No, but anyway, that's the bandwidth right there. And the bandwidth is broken up into these different resource blocks. And there are 76 resource blocks. Yeah, and you need and you're you're wanting to assign the oh. number of bits per quam symbol for each. Okay, so that's why that number is so high. Yeah. Yes. So this is a vector, a three bit vector that's 76. Yeah. There's 70 it's it, let's say vertically there's 76 rows and and three bits per row to equal 228. And then the three bits are encoded, like the very first one would be for resource block zero chunk. Um, yeah. And then um, and then they're enumerated th to seven, right? Um, and so what is QAM uh, 64? Is that, how many bits is that? Six bits. So, yeah. So. You have zero, one, two, one would be BPSK, two would be QPSK. QPSK, exactly. And that's 16 QAM. 16 QAM. And then this one here is uh, is 64. essentially 64 QAM. So you, and then these yeah, here that's... would probably never be used. Yeah. Um, let's just say I'm going to put an underline there. But um, for oh. because right now we only define sixty four qualm anyways. If you go to um, here, but uh, we'll just say that these are reserved for future use essentially. Um, and then okay, all right, sounds good. But we can reduce that to eight bits. It's two hundred and twenty eight combinations, right? No. Well, is, is it? Is well, it seventy six times times three, or how many combinations are there? Because I think we could probably use a table lookup and get that lot lower. We don't well, have to well, directly well, encode well, it, yeah. right? Well, let's. Well, first of all, we want to keep this simple, and and second of all, so um, let's say how do I unhighlight this? So it'd really be seventy six times. Look, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'll skip skip over, and I'll see if I can reduce the number of bits required in that field. So I'll just take that offline because I think well, so, we can. So think of it like this. Um, no, no, don't. I, oh, oh, are you? Yeah, I, I didn't want you to have to to dwell on anything that I that I said well, about I'll, the I'll encoding. Let, let me. Um, so we're using three bits per block, right? And there's uh, seventy six yeah. blocks. And the reason why we need at least three is because you got the case where there's zero. You know, you're not transmitting any data, and then you got the supported things up to. Quam 64, right? This is, uh, are we doing, yeah, 64. Uh, so you 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 at least, at least need to enumerate the, you know, those four modulation standards. And if we go up to, from 64 to, what's the next step up? Is that 128 or is that? Um, 256. 256, Quam 256. Um, so, yeah, so there's, uh, unless we throw out the zero or whatever, you know, right. we would, we could do it in two, which would shrink this number down, but, or make the block size larger. How many uh, REs are this in a vertical fashion? How many resource elements? Yeah. Uh, you can see it by the K, you know, where it says K equals zero, and then all the way at the top, it says K, nine, 12, and 840. So that's, those are the resource. So you mean resource blocks or resource elements? So this resource block that you have right here, how many elements 12. are in the vertically here? 12. Right here? 12. Huh? 12. 12. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that you could do if we 
we wanted to make this smaller, which I, I don't think we need to. We could increase the block size from 12 to some other number, you know, like 24. But I, yeah, I, I, I think that this is um, a, a I, kind of a good, easy way to, to do it. And then it allows for future expansion, which would be, let's say, these things here um, of the, which uh, my guess is we'll never use, but uh, you I never know. Are those included already in the 228? Well, the, yeah, so. Okay, so yeah, the 76 times eight, uh, you know, co if you just do the combinatorics, it's 608 different patterns. If you round it up to 1024, that's a 10 bit ta table lookup. So you could reduce it from 228 down to 10 bits and you'd still have uh, 400 and some odd uh, combination overhead. So, um, well, the 76 is related to the number of REs that are um, in a blo resource block. So you're you're thinking of doing, you're, you're saying to reduce it, you would do what now? What you would do is encode a table lookup. So it's 608 different combinations to handle all 76. The, the three bits gives you eight different choices. And I mean, if you wanted to, to have even more, you could, but it sounds like all those eight include these three things that haven't even been implemented yet. So if you just st stick with three bits and you have 76 different uh, resource blocks, so 76 times eight is 608, um, go ahead and call that 1024. That's the next um, the binary number up from that. That's a 10-bit table lookup. So you have a 10-bit number and a table lookup for the thing. So you could reduce that field, which... That's a it's a decent reduction. If we're in, if we're all in for low latency, then any field that we can reduce with a table lookup, you could also do that for some of the other stuff in here. But the most of the fields are pretty small. But any big field, I'm going to look at and want to to reduce. So you could get it down to ten bits and still have four hundred options uh, margin for future expansion. Don't worry about it now. But that just just know that we can improve that. All right, so yeah, I'd have to think about that for a second. Um, the um, yeah, so there's so you're saying that if we take this uh, um, five bits times um, five different settings, right, essentially, and multiply that by seventy six, is that what you're saying? No, I multiplied it by eight because you need three bits to contain the information. Right. So I just I just kept it at three. So three times seventy six. Oh, I see. Or sorry, eight times seventy six. Sorry. So you have eight eight options, seventy six different places. The that combination is is six hundred and eight. Make sure I did it right, but I'm just saying that there's there's opportunities to make that smaller with a. You, instead of directly encoding the number of bits per QAM symbol, you're saying, okay, what am I after? I'm after this pattern. How many patterns total are there? Well, oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Okay, so basically you're... And then you're picking a pattern rather than picking each individual uh, allocation of, of bits per, per resource block. You're picking the entire pattern for the whole thing at each time slot. Like, you know, it's... I think it yeah, may, yeah. so the latency just this, just from reducing the number of bits in the field is a gain, but it, it also may help with, um, if you, you don't have to update per resource block, it's not something you have to do per resource block. It would be something you could do, you could set once and, and fetch. So it would be, uh, I, I think that might also help with, with cycle count for the firmware. Yeah, I mean, this makes it real simple. And yes, we're not is. trying to save bits here because we're replicating this several times throughout this um, signal field. And it's this is a direct mapping of, um, you, you know, so you just, oh, yeah. you know, okay. chunk it over directly into that. And then as you're processing the blocks, you're just, you can think of this as a, let's say, um, a, you know, a three bit lookup that's addressed based on the next power of two above 76. And then you're as you're marching through the resource blocks, 
you just read the number directly off of there. So it makes it pretty easy rather than an indirect lookup like what you're saying. Okay. Um, I, I think that that uh, the idea that you had is certainly interesting. Um, I And uh, somebody could, uh, we, we could um, have something like that in, in there, but I, I don't think we're trying to save resource. Uh, uh, we're, we're trying to reduce the number of bits here in this field because this um, signal field, if you look at it, 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 it occupies, um, where's that at? Uh, damn it. It's okay. Um, you, you can, you can move on. It's, uh, it's all right. Um, the signal field is going to occupy one OFDM signal here. So one column and one, one column ends up being, um, you, you know, uh, for a K of 912, it's 912 resource elements, right? Right. Yes. So, hold on, hold on. So is there going to be on the first reference, um, depends on if there's pilot symbols or not, but anyways, there, there's um, plenty of resource elements to represent that is what I'm saying. Yes, that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, why don't we go to the bottom, uh, Leonard, to look like? What, where? I mean, I put a, put a whole bunch of work into showing like a diagram of the transmitter so that you guys can, you know, a, suge a suggested implementation of what it would look like to make it easier. This right here is not really that here. I'm just showing that whatever reference oscillator exists, it should drive both the, the the baseband processor in the back, and it should also drive the synthesizer that is creating the uh, the 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 LO, the local oscillator, meaning the 800 megahertz or the 2.4 gig or whatever uh, center frequency. That's very very common nowadays in almost all modern modems, RF modems, and it just helps. Uh, it helps. It helps um, with something funky here because it it, mean, it means that the frequency offset between your between the transmitter and the receiver is proportional to the the timing drift between the two, and you can guess from one to the other. It's it's a synchronization uh, thing that makes synchronization easier, uh, but everybody does it nowadays, and it doesn't make any sense anybody to do it any other way at least in my opinion. Uh, so if you want to have a high performance modern kind of modem, then you should be doing that. Okay, anyways, um, uh, but, there's- But it's not, it's not mandatory, it's, but it's, it's like, okay, you can do it and it helps, helps things quite a bit. Why don't you go towards like the end, maybe page uh, 759. Seven fifty nine. Okay, so we're mm -hmm. keep going, keep going, keep going, uh, keep going. So there's some of this SFBC stuff that uh, Vishal wanted to see, and it sort of shows how stuff is mapped into the resource grid. Uh, if you have just one antenna, and if you have two antennas. So, All right, so let's see here. Uh, let me um. How do I? The thing is, is that this, um, yeah. never mind. Uh, the fact that I've got two of these things open is, is, is not helping. Okay, 759. Okay, here we go. Yes, exactly. So this is what, how I think the receiver could look like, of course, it's really just separating it kind of into different functions. Like, um, for example, we need, you know, we need to error encode uh, pieces of data and they could be separate pieces of data. Uh, so it, over here on the left, you can see the Mac and it, it 
pushes through these data blocks of, of, of data and they get CRC encoded, they, they get error encoded, and then they could get stored off in a RAM. What that means is that you can, you can basically uncouple certain events, you know, because for example, for, further on the right side, you see this preamble, the preamble ROM, which would be another implementation suggestion where you, because the preamble always stays the same, you can just read it into some kind of memory thing and just read it out through the DAC. You don't have to generate it every time. So when that guy gets read out, immediately after that, you've got to produce you know, the signal field and payload A and payload B. And, and so the transmitter, he's got to do that rapidly in succession and different, you know, rather different processing things have to be coordinated in time properly. So this thing can read out the OFDM symbols, you know, in one easy stream. So I thought about uh, how you would do that. And an easy way that came to me is that, you know, certain functions could be done ahead of time. You could do all the, the for example, all the error encoding and then just have it sit in a RAM and then you can, you can suck it out of that RAM whenever you want, you know, and whenever the rest of the system says, hey, I, you know, I need this error encoded data stream right now, you know, and, you know, you can't just go to the Mac and say, hey, Mac, you know, give me the data and push it through all this stuff uh, because who knows how, how long that takes. You, you, you know, you need it now. So it's better if it, the idea here is that it already sits in a RAM. It's already been, it's already, already been computed and you just suck it out at demand. Yeah, yeah. And you're really talking about this guy right here, right? Uh, so so there's a so there's a couple here. So if you look, first look at the the code block RAM, right? <clears throat> Further on the left, the blue. Yeah, there we are. So so this would be the result of the error. This is the error encoded information, right? Once the information is error encoded, you will, you know, you'll have to you'll have to do the rate matching, the interleaving. You have to uh, convert it to symbol maps, which is further at the bottom, if you can, you know, which is below the orange block, you see it. Yeah, there we are, right? So that has to be done. And then it has to be, sh has to be shoved into this, to these resource grids, right? And that, that's what you were pointing on before. The resource grid RAMs. Yeah. <clears throat> Once it sits in there and it's all done, then, then the OFDM, the module can just go, hey, give me, give me this block of, you know, 10, 24 things, and I'm going to shove it in by my to my IFFT. Then give me the next one. Give me the next one. Give me the next one. It just go boom, 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 and it just makes timing so much easier, in my opinion. If there are these intermediate memory elements, you know that that in a way make it easier for you for for for, for the overall timing in the modem. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I put, you know, there, there could be different ways of doing that. If you guys have a clever idea of how else it could be done, then uh, that would be cool. But in my head, I just thought, oh my God, you know, this, there, there are certain tasks in the transmitter that are sort of time critical and time sensitive. And how, how, do, you, how do you even approach this? And this is kind of what, what I'm suggesting here in this picture. Yeah, so then, so this stage right here. Uh-huh. Um, at this point, we're representing um, the the memory in a resource grid fashion. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. and then um, depending on which antenna you're going out, you're going to have um, different mappings. Yes, exactly. That's why. That's why the. That's why there's two different memories right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. The so orange one, block th is... one thing that I, I've done here is like if we, um, there's always this ARQ thing. So remember in the yes. overall link, we're going to have this case where uh, the receiver doesn't receive stuff. It's going to request you to resend it. Mm -hmm. The way that I've kind of done it before, mainly because it's, um, uh, 
mainly because it's um, more efficient to do that. Have <clears throat> uh, on the fly FEC encoding, and then you save, uh, you have uh, DSP, uh, I'm sorry, DDR, since it's fairly cheap, you can pack a lot of information in here. You have uh, RAM here. And essentially what you have is um, uh, 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 the DDR segmented in such a way that it's kind of, um, let's say block based. And um, you can index, you, you have a, a head pointer and a tail pointer, but you also have this kind of um, act pointer as well. So it's it's like a circular buffer or a FIFO, but it's got three pointers in it. So mm -hmm. your head pointer, you got your stuff that you're piling on there, right? So um you know you're 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 writing stuff into the fifo and the stuff that's being read out of the fifo or the circular buffer whatever it is um is the stuff that's like in play in the air and then your arq pointer is basically somewhere in the middle there but it's the stuff that's been act you know right and then if it's if this the difference between the read and the act or whatever it is is the stuff that's in play that hasn't been act yet. And it, after something gets knacked or expires in time, you can jump back to where it was, the read pointer back to where the act pointer was and resend that stuff. So um, that's all kind of memory play with, you know, adjusting pointers and stuff like that. But I do it here mainly because um, after you FEC encode it, you know, it'll take twice as much. You know, for a rate one half, you'll, or even a quarter, it takes, you know, for rate one quarter, right? It takes right, right. Four, four times more memory, right? So yeah, you're, yeah. I know DRAM's cheap. So you're, we're talking about a lot of DRAM, but I'm usually talking about stuff that's going, you have thousands of frames in play because it's going to the spotlight and back or whatever, you know, because you, you miss, you, you, you miss something due to atmospheric conditions. Uh, you lose a link for a few milliseconds and we're already taught you drop thousands of frames of whatever it is, you know. Well, I think it's a good idea. Uh, I mean, we have to store it somewhere, you know, whatever mm -hmm. was sent in the past has to be stored. Otherwise, the ARQ can't work at all, right? So it's got to be there. So the, I, um, it's a good idea. I have a question. Go ahead. What's the use case for ARQ? A ARQ is mainly like if you don't want to, like you've got some application out here, right? And uh, you want to have guaranteed delivery. Okay, but not for a video. Well, it, so ARQ this is like for a live video. This doesn't make any sense. But for if you were if you were using this to transmit a file, like a, a data. So you're talking about ARQ for for data modes. Uh, well, a so in in the drone, uh, they do do ARQ in there, but it's um, uh, mainly because they're they're compressing the the stream, right? They're using um, you know H.264 uh, or five or whatever, and and a lot of times they'll they'll change the code rates. So there is you know gaps in time, so you can you know, re resend a, a portion of a frame, but in, in NTSC land, yeah, you're right. Um, but I use it uh, in satellite communications, mainly for exactly what you're talking about, guaranteed delivery of a data packet of data of a file or whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's just a lot of extra mechanism for something that like I would consider uh, live video to, I mean, we, we rarely, if ever do any sort of resend. But for data, uh, if you know, if we want this to work for data, then that's going to be. Is it something that that can be handled at a higher layer, though? I mean, there is there is higher layer portion of this as well, right? Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just thinking maybe can we offload anything like ARQ to a higher layer rather than have it in the physical layer, or or you know, are are we are we committed to to doing this? I think um, we should. I mean, the higher layer stuff is like. If like the packet, if the entire packet doesn't get there, you know, or there's some error and we don't know, we have to, 
we have to do like a, a huge amount of resending. This right here, it allows us to resend a lot less, right? If you if you do it here in the physical layer the way Leonard says, then you can get away with only resending a very very small portion, the portion that had an error in it. The one that's further upstream, the one you're talking about, exists also, like you know, like in the I don't know. It exists, but it would be for much more data. Yeah, in in the FPV drone guys absolutely want this to be done in the physical air, you know, in the well, because they don't have any there's not usually an application layer for, for a lot of this. Or the application layer is very thin. Well, they're well, so the FPV guys are usually racing. Yeah. And um, you're, you're, you know, a 20 millisecond delay is, is a lot to them. And the, if, if the, if you're getting, because you're using H.264 or five, you're going to get, you know, macro block code errors, you know, once, once you get packets that are missing. And so what they're going to see on the screen is, you know, just a bunch of blocks dropping out off, you know, so they don't want to see that because they're, they're navigating around tight obstacles and, um, and the encoder is such that, you know, it's sending, you know, the frame faster than, you know, the, the date, the bandwidth of the link is, is got more availability than than what's going out from the video. So they do have enough bandwidth to resend a block. And um, okay, do we have that bandwidth here? This, uh, do we have a similar? Yeah, -ish? 40 megabits is enough. 20 megabits okay. is enough, you know, so it, it definitely is. Um, so, okay, cool. And they actually want a more advanced version of what we're talking about. They, they, they want to send uh, FEC blocks that are punctured. Yeah, they, they want to do what's called a hybrid arc, and we're we kind of push them back on that, at least for this in, initial first implementation. Um, they want to do hybrid arc, where basically um, you puncture the code, you send a you know like a, a, a so uh, let's say you encode the block at like rate one half, you puncture it and send seven eights, and and then if you get a and knack back, you send the remaining bits that you never sent. And then over at the other end, you combine that. So the idea is that, you know, you're not selling, sending a whole block, you're sending a portion of a block. Uh, that is a, that's what they're doing now. That's what DGI is doing. And, um, you know, for us, it's, it, that's a monumental task, you know, to kind of coordinate all that. I, I kind of really don't want to, do it. I, I kind of wonder if we even need to do it. And it's really going to be if we have a strong encoder and decoder and uh, the, the block sizes are relatively, you know, kind of ma smaller managed, then we might may, may not need that. That's yeah, that I would mean. that would be a very good, like, like focused trade study thing to do. It would, it's a very interesting problem. Anyways, our time is up. Um, so Andrew, Andreas, do you want to say anything in closing? Um, I mean, you guys can go ahead and look at the other, there, there's also a, a receiver diagram for that at the bottom. Uh, you guys can look at that offline if you want. And, um, here's kind, kind of, of a, a notional receiver diagram here, right? Yes. It's, it's kind of the same thing, same idea of it's, yeah, this it is not. This isn't a not a requirement. This is just a hey. We've thought about this a lot. Here is yeah. a potential architecture that may help you, right? Yeah, it's yeah. notional. Notional. Yeah, right, I think exactly. that's a that's a that's a great thing to to include. Um, because it's, it's going to be very helpful. You know, as long as people know, like, no, you don't have to. <laughs> like, we're not prescribing this. We're suggesting that you weigh and consider this. Uh, you know, because there's some good choices in here. Yeah, so the, I mean, all of the documents call the FlexLink standard. It's, it's really, you know, kind of a, um, mixed in with like, it's written like a book, you know, hey, um, how, how do you go about doing this? And what's a lightweight standard that we can use? I mean, it's, it's, it's a combination of the standard plus notional 
implementation uh, notes, you know, whatever. I mean, it, we can just kind of say it like that. And re really anybody, like when we we're talking about the signal fields, you know, there's format one or whatever, we can invent our own formats or whoever is doing it for a specific application, you know, could do it, whatever. It, granted that if like, let's say we got a, a loose, you know, kind of a, a what do you call it? Um, if we were to do a FPV implementation that was uh, meant to be interoperable with a bunch of different people, we'd have to, you know, uh, let them know, everybody know, okay, this, this is our variant of, let's say the flex link, you know, protocol. Right. That makes sense. Anyways, um, that's really all I have. You guys can close or whatever. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody. This is super helpful. And I, I know that a lot of folks are very interested in the, the, uh, details implementation or pulling for it to be successful. Um, and let's see, I'll, I can, uh, host another meeting on, uh, this coming Monday. And, uh, so six days from now and looking forward to that, uh, we should be able to get, uh, Ed Friesma from Las Vegas to, to drop by, um, and I'll, I'll keep spreading the word and see, uh, see, see how much further we can get in the next week. So I've been working over on a, a receiver design for the, for the big transponder, uh, over the, over the past week. So I don't have a lot of hardware, uh, progress on, on Neptune. Um, but yeah, I think now I'm, now I'm in better shape understanding what the SFBC was that no, it's not requiring actual physical, you know, <laughs> transmit diversity. That's, that's not what it, that's not what it's meant. Uh, but it all makes sense because it's, uh, you know, all the math works out, everything's, it's really pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting that, uh, at least a prototype of that up and running, possibly over the next week. So when we meet again, may have some, uh, some drawings to show and some, some working models. Cool. You know that Mondays I'm packed with meetings, so oh dear. on Monday I can't, I can't attend anything on Monday, which is okay. Though. Okay, it's, yeah, uh, let's let's go ahead. I'll I'll host a meeting on on uh, on Monday for anybody that we have a couple uh, of people who could only meet on Monday, and then and then sure. I can also we can we can do another meeting. Uh, I think Leonard, did you prefer Thursdays? Because I we can do both next week, no problem. Um. You know, uh, yeah, Thursdays or maybe Friday, even you know. Um, yeah, let's do let's do Thursday to check back in with us, and then you know the 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 uh, Monday meeting can be just basics, uh, or or people getting started working in the VMs, working in the environment, working in the lab, which is you know uh, just getting folks up to speed and answering the much more basic questions than than what we're tackling. So. So I'll do that. So you'll see two different meeting invitations go out on the list and and on Slack. But but let's we can, we'll meet on Thursdays, or ne we'll meet next Thursday, and then we'll just we'll play it by ear. I want I want to work in with people's schedules and and for this to be a, a happy, uh, you know, and and productive and and joyful experience, and 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 not have to compete with with the uh, scheduled days. Okay, sounds good. You bet. All right. Thanks. This is super cool. And see y'all on Slack and uh, next week. Okay. Bye.